Okay, great. Well, thanks for joining us, everybody. I'm Terrence Flynn, the biofarm analyst here at Goldman Sachs, and we're very pleased to have Bristol Myers Squibb with us this morning. Joining us from the company, we have Giovanni Caporio, who is chairman and CEO. Giovanni, thank you very much for being here this morning. Really appreciate the time. Thank you, Terrence. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, so maybe to kick off, um, as everyone knows, this is uh, about the one-year anniversary of when you announced the Celgene deal. Um, would love for you to maybe recap the progress that's been made here since the announcement. And looking ahead, what are really the key drivers that we should all be focused on as we think about you guys generating a return from the, uh, the acquisition? Sure. Thank you, Terrence. And again, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, let me just say, first of all, I, uh, I feel better uh, about uh, Bristol Myers Quib uh, uh, today that I felt uh, when we announced the acquisition of uh, Celgene. Um, I feel better in terms of the potential the acquisition provides uh, for us to have created uh, the, uh, the leading biopharma company uh, and the opportunities that we have ahead of us. Uh, and so let me just give you a couple of perspectives as to why uh, I think uh, things uh, are going as well or better than planned. First of all, uh, we have a, a number of uh, uh, businesses that have continued to have really strong performance uh, in 2019. When you look at our hematology franchise uh, with Revlimid and Pomalist, uh, that uh, has continued to be uh, a good driver of growth. Obdivo has performed uh, uh, very well in the indications where it's approved. Um, Eliquis uh, continues to be a driver of growth uh, for the company, and pretty much everywhere you look, the commercial performance of the business has been strong. Uh, the second thing uh, uh, that I uh, want to say is that uh, we are working on eight uh, exciting launches over a period of two years. Uh, and there has been significant clinical and regulatory process uh, with uh, many of those launch opportunities. Uh, well, I would say on the clinical side, uh, we had two positive uh, studies for Obdigo in combination with Yervoin, first-line lung cancer, uh, last year. Uh, we um, also uh, had the pivotal trial data from, for JGAR-17 in lymphoma, which was presented at ASH uh, and, uh, at the end of last year, uh, and that data uh, really confirmed our perspective with respect, with respect to the differentiated profile of JGAR-17 in lymphoma. We had, uh, we had in-house uh, the data for BB2121, the, the BCMA CAR-T uh, in partnership with Bluebird, uh, and that's an important asset as well. And finally, uh, we presented some really interesting data on uh, CC486, which is an oral agent that uh, can really be established potentially as uh, a maintenance uh, uh, standard for patients with the AML. Uh, and um, so significant clinical progress with, uh, uh, with the late stage pipeline. On the regulatory front, uh, we were able to uh, submit the file for Ozanimod. Uh, we received approval for in Rebec. In Rebec. We did receive approval for Rebozil in uh, Betatal. Uh, and we have important PADUFA coming, PADUFA dates coming for Ozanimal in March uh, in multiple sclerosis, uh, Reblozil in MDS in April. We also filed the, uh, uh, the submitted the file for JCAR-17 in lymphoma at the end of the year. And so when you really think about the volume of activity from a clinical uh, and regulatory perspective, we're very much on track uh, for eight potential launches over a period of approximately two years, which is unprecedented for us and, and in many ways, uh, I think, in our, in, in our sector as well. You may remember that at the beginning of last year, I spoke uh, about six potential launches. I'm now speaking about eight potential launches uh, because obviously the data in first-line lung cancer came later and, and 486 uh, in, in AML came later. So that's an indicator of the third reason why uh, I'm excited about the potential of the company, which is really the depth and breadth of the early pipeline uh, and the multiple opportunities that we have ahead of us. So, for example, I think we had a really good ASH uh, in December, and at ASH we presented many of the data that I referenced. We also presented some data on our BCMAT cell engager, which was early data, 
from the early pipeline, that data is early. It's a small number of patients, but it's very compelling as well. Um, and, and again, speaks to uh, the strength of the early pipeline of Bristol Myers Clip going forward. So I would say I feel really good about where we are. Uh, there is a lot that is going to be happening to us in 2020, uh, but we're in a very good position as a company as we start 2020. Great. Well, I think that's a great overview to kick us off, and we're going to get into a number of the um, these uh, topic points over the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Um, maybe one near-term question, then a long-term question. Near-term, you know, one of the focal points has been 2020 guidance. Um, you guys gave some preliminary thoughts about that when you announced the deal. Maybe just give us an um, uh, update in terms of when to expect the new guidance. And then the second question is, do you expect to provide both revenue and EPS guidance. I know historically you guys just give EPS, but Belgian obviously has given more metrics. So how do you think about guidance over the, the near term? Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, let me say I, I understand the importance of uh, articulating the financial profile of a new company and investors are interested in, in us providing guidance. We have not uh, communicated externally exactly uh, what the elements of that guidance will be. What I can tell you is that we will provide guidance uh, at our uh, fourth, quarter, fourth quarter earnings call uh, when we communicate the full results of 2019 and the outlook for 20. That's what we've usually done uh, as a company, and that's what we're going to do this year. And, and our uh, call is scheduled, I believe, for February 6th. Okay. And one follow-up is just that I know you guys in uh, late last year reiterated the over 40% EPS accretion the first year. Is that still on a target? I know there are some moving pieces here, not asking for official guidance, but just to think about that target you guys put out there. Um, how should we think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think the way to think about it is a number of things have been ha have happened since then. Uh, first of all, obviously, we've divested of Tesla. We also divested our UPSA business, which is our consumer medicines business in Europe. Uh, and then at the same time, uh, all of the things that I just discussed point to real strength in the business. Uh, the other thing that I would say is we are very much on track with the synergies. Uh, and so, as you will remember, we committed to $2.5 billion in synergies uh, uh, and uh, about a third, a third, a third during a period of three years. Uh, and we are very much on track with that plan, and that is reflected in our outlook for 2020. So when I look at 2020, uh, again, uh, from the perspective of the financial profile of the company, I feel pretty good about where we are. Great. Um, we'll look forward to that next month. Um, the other question is just a long-term one here um, that we get frequently. I'm sure you do as well. But just as we think about, you know, the next couple of years, a big reason you did Celgene was to get access to a late-stage pipeline. You have some upcoming LOEs to think about. So how do you manage through that LOE period here? Um, that's, you know, one of the, the longer-term focal points. Obviously, Celgene a part of that. But what's the other component of the strategy? Sure. Sure. I think that from my perspective, you know, when we started thinking about the long-term uh, prospects for Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, and we really thought about the second half of the decade uh, with the losses of exclusivity of Eliquis and then of Vivo, it was really important for us to begin to prepare uh, for uh, the transition of our portfolio in time. I, I guess, you know, one comment that I have is this is the nature of our business. Uh, and uh, we at Bristol Myers Squibb have renewed our portfolio and our business successfully before when we launched ex when we lost ex exclusivity for Plavix and Abilify. Those were very meaningful, uh, and the productivity of our R&D and business development engines enabled us uh, to renew our portfolio. And so, when I think about the future, I think about it in very much the same way. First of all, I believe the uh, late stage pipeline of the company today is clearly the broadest it's ever been. I believe it is one of the most promising in the industry. When you look at the number of opportunities we have for launches, and when you look at the fact that every, pretty much uh, every one of the assets uh, that we have an opportunity to launch have life cycle management potential opportunities for, with other indications coming, I think there is significant uh, potential from the late stage pipeline. I believe that one of the core pillars of our strategy, Bristol Myers Squibb, has always been uh, to basically take innovation both internally and externally. And business development has always been uh, a core pillar of our capital allocation strategy. So I, I see that continuing in the future. 
And I believe that as a company now, we have significant financial strength and flexibility. Now, obviously, in the next couple of years, uh, our commitment is to delever uh, and go back to the and go to the 1.5 debt to EBITDA ratio that we have committed to by the end of 2022. I think that the divestiture of Tesla enables us in many ways to be uh, getting there faster. Uh, and so in the next couple of years, I do expect us to probably do smaller deals that are more science-driven deals. Uh, but I believe the company will continue to have significant flexibility financially. Uh, and then in a couple of years, uh, the opportunity to do medium-sized and larger deals as well. Uh, and so I think it's a real combination of a broad pipeline and the right expertise to be doing the right type of business development. And do you have goals in terms of how much internal versus external you think about in terms of the, the right mix of the pipeline, or is it more science opportunity driven? Uh, we've never looked at it that way. I think what we, the way we look at it is uh, we look at deals that, number one, make sense strategically. And what I mean by that is they need to be in areas where we have deep internal expertise that makes us believe that uh, we will be able to deliver value from those assets. The second thing is it needs to be breakthrough science. Uh, and the third one is it must make sense financially. And in fact, if you really think about it, those three lenses uh, were also the drivers of the acquisition of Celgi. Uh, and what I'm encouraged with is the fact that when I look at our uh, research organization, number one, we have real expertise in some of the most attractive and interesting areas of science right now. Number two, we have research sites that are embedded in the best hubs of innovation in the United States. And number three, in every one of those units, we've created an integrated unit that goes from discovery to translational medicine, early development, business development. They're all focused on their specific area of expertise. They have a real opportunity to interact uh, with outside sources of innovation uh, and be able to recognize promising science that we want to bring into the company. Okay, great. Maybe one of the other reasons that you guys cited for the Celgene deal is diversifying the revenue base in terms of your mix of both Medicare Part B and Part D. Obviously, you have a unique, unique perspective here from your um, seat as chairman of Pharma. What changes, if any, would you expect to see on the drug pricing front this year? Um, I know last year that was a big focal point for the industry. Things seem to have stalled out, at least from my perspective, somewhat. But would be curious from your seat what you see for this year on the horizon. Sure. I think that, you know, first of all, what I, what I have to say is it's really difficult to predict uh, what policy changes may be, uh, may be uh, implemented in the short term. Uh, and I think that's difficult for, to forecast for, for all of us, no matter where we are. I think what's important is that some reform is because uh, the uh, incentives in our, in our uh, system are, uh, are not aligned. Uh, to making medicine affordable for patients. When you, when you look at uh, even the, the latest data that is available on uh, drug spending in 2018, drug spending in 2018 grew uh, about 2.5%. Uh, of that, less than 1% was priced. Uh, and the growth of, of pharmaceutical spend in 18 was uh, aligned or lower uh, with respect to the growth uh, of uh, the other parts of healthcare, and I expect that to continue. But then, when you look at, uh, but then when you look at patient exposure, uh, over the last few years, patient out-of-pocket exposure has grown by 50 percent, uh, disproportionately versus the total spend for pharmaceuticals. And right now, when you look at our market in the U.S., almost. 50% of the spend for pharmaceutical goes to the supply chain. Uh, and, and only about 54% uh, goes to innovative companies that develop uh, breakthrough pharmaceutical innovation. And so there is a real need for reform. And I think that the reform uh, that is focused on improving the affordability for patients is one that the industry supports. What may happen uh, in the short term, I think it's very difficult to, to assess. What I can tell you is that you are right. We are better positioned today than we were before. We have a more diversified business, and we have a more balanced mix uh, between uh, Part B, Part D, 
commercial versus Medicare and different parts of uh, uh, the market from a portfolio perspective at Bristol Quid. So at, uh, during a period of time, of, of change, I think we're better positioned today than we were before uh, to continue to be able to continue to invest uh, and be successful during a period of policy change. And I know you don't want to hazard a guess in terms of the Senate bill and, you know, probability that it moves forward this year. But as you think about that bill, what are the areas that the industry is supportive of and what are the areas that you think, you know, could be maybe uh, adapted somewhat? Listen, there are many areas the industry is supportive of. So uh, establishing out-of-pocket caps uh, for seniors, I think that's a priority for the industry. I think that is very, very important. Reducing the contribution uh, of patients to the expense during the, the coverage gap, uh, I think that's very important. Spreading uh, the cost that patients incur during the year uh, uh, throughout the year from what happens today where it's concentrated in the first month of the year to, to a model where it is more evenly distributed uh, throughout the year. I think that's a measure uh, that the industry is really supportive of. Anything uh, that enables uh, sort of increased penetration of generics, biosimilars uh, in the market. Innovation companies like ours, ours uh, are always going to be supported. Price controls uh, that stifle innovation without really improving affordability for patients, I think these are things we're not supportive of. But I would say there are many elements of that bill that, uh, that are supportive of, of patient affordability. Uh, that we believe are, are really valuable. There are parts we, we don't believe would support innovative uh, medicines and, and won't help patients. Maybe just one more on that before we move on to the, the commercial side and the pipeline. Um, the, you know, IPI Part B demo that was announced still hasn't gone through. Just wondering, theoretically, if it were to be enacted, do you think there could be a legal challenge from the industry to that, given some of the questions about how broad that would be covering 50% of the population? Just wondering from more from a theoretical perspective. Yeah, I, I think that's difficult to, to, uh, to answer until all of the details are known. What I can tell you is that some of those policies would be extremely damaging uh, to the industry. They would reduce the number of new medicines uh, that, that go to patients. They won't improve uh, the affordability of medicine unless benefit design changes are implemented. So some of the ones you describe uh, are, 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 are ones the industry is not supportive of. I think we need to make sure uh, that policies support uh, the recognition of U.S. pharmaceutical innovation abroad, uh, and I think that should be the priority. Okay. Great. Um, you talked about some of this in your opening remarks, but the ASH and a lot of the data you had there, you know, the buzz in the hallways was this was one of the best ASHs for the cell gene portfolio in a number of years. You have a, a number of assets in multiple myeloma, particularly against BCMA, which one is, is one of the newest, uh, most exciting targets in the area. Um, it's also very competitive because of how uh, interesting of a target it is. So as you guys think about defending your position in myeloma, how should we think about that? What are the keys that we should be focused on, and how are you positioned now coming out of ASH to protect that franchise? Yeah. Um, so, Terrence, first of all, let me say it was a really good ASH, and it was good to be there, uh, and it really showed the strength of Bristol-Myers Quibi hematology going forward. There was a lot of data uh, that was presented, and it was all uh, really compelling uh, clinical data that met or exceeded expectations in, in, in many areas. Uh, I think the multiple myeloma field is an important field for us, of course. Uh, and uh, I, you know, as, as uh, the company that uh, has uh, really transformed uh, the treatment of multiple myeloma through the cell gene uh, legacy, of course, uh, we, we have deep knowledge and expertise in that area. There has been a lot of progress that has been made in multiple myeloma, but multiple myeloma is not being cured. There continue to be... Uh, many patients that progress through multiple lines of therapy and need new treatment options. And so we are very committed to continue to invest uh, in the development of new medicines in multiple myeloma because we believe the medical need remains very high. Uh, BCMA is one of the most promising targets, uh, and I believe it can be the next big target uh, that we discuss in multiple myeloma and in blood cancers in general. 
And uh, one of the things that we were attracted to from the beginning was the fact that we have the ability now to have multiple approaches against BCMA. And what you saw at ASH was two different approaches playing out. There was clear uh, interest in BB2121 as the first-in-class uh, CAR-T uh, agent in multiple myeloma, but also there was early data from our T-cell engager program uh, that was considered to be uh, very compelling from a clinical perspective. And I uh, obviously, uh, uh, and obviously we will advance both programs uh, as well as other ways of attacking uh, BCMA. Ultimately, uh, you're right, this is a very competitive field. I believe we're very well positioned. Uh, and uh, I think that the way I think about BCMA is that as often in oncology, um, there, will be, uh, there will be an initial focus on late stage uh, patients that have failed multiple uh, lines of therapy, but ultimately the most effective agents uh, will continue to, to move uh, to the front line, and I think that's what uh, we're planning on doing in the future. Uh, I think there is room for more than one mechanism of action in, in, uh, in, a, in attacking BCMA. There may be patients that benefit from uh, the efficacy of uh, a CAR-T approach, which is one administration. Those may be patients that have you know, proximity to academic institutions, uh, a real ability for a long-term durable response. There may be patients that prefer to be treated with a more conventional approach, uh, like a T-cell engager. We don't have to think about BCMA as there's only going to be one modality that wins. I think our portfolio is, is, is broad of opportunities in BCMA. There may be more than one uh, that eventually plays a really meaningful role in the treatment of multiple myeloma. I think it will start in the late stage setting, but I do believe it will move to high risk patients in the front, in the, in the earlier stage. Uh, and uh, obviously, as very knowledgeable in the field, we're putting all of our efforts in that. Great. I mean, that's a good segue to my uh, follow up question, which is you know, one of the other um, key uh, pieces of Celgene deal was the CAR T portfolio. So, uh, BB2121, you mentioned, JCAR17 is the other. Um, you mentioned moving to the earlier stage setting. So that's one of the goals um, for the CAR-T therapies, but there have been some hurdles with the initial launches. So maybe at a high level, you could just talk to us about how you as a company are going to move CAR-T earlier into earlier lines of therapy. How do you think about BB2121 playing there and the strategy for JCAR-17, given some of the challenges we've seen so far with some of the early entrants? Sure. sure. I think that, you know, from my perspective, when you look at the challenges that have happened, uh, with some of the early entrants. They've been primarily related to uh, uh, access and reimbursement in Medicare. They've been related to the referral of patients to academic institutions with the experience uh, uh, to treat patients with, with a technology like car -T. So I'm going to use the example of JCAR-17 and the profile of JCAR-17. Uh, and, uh, you know, I do believe it is a differentiated profile. It is, it is very effective, but it also has a very different profile in terms of uh, side, serious side effects and incidence of CRS. Uh, and you've seen some data at ASH where uh, the product is being, is being used in the outpatient setting. So I think that the move of CAR-T from a small number of academic institutions to a large, larger number of academic institutions and the ability uh, to potentially administer the product in the outpatient setting, these are all drivers of expansion of the market. When I speak about outpatient setting, I'm obviously not speaking about a small practice in the community. I'm speaking about the outpatient setting within hospitals, uh, institutions, and very large networks of oncologists. I think there is a real opportunity for JGAR-17 there. The data presented uh, clearly spoke to the possibility of using that product uh, in the outpatient setting. I think there is progress on the access front. There's clearly no problem uh, on the commercial side, on the Medicare side. Uh, there is clear uh, progress towards better reimbursement. And obviously, in that setting, uh, the use in the outpatient setting from an access perspective uh, from a reimbursement perspective, would be significantly uh, easier as well. The third point that I would say is 
uh, the referral of, of patients from the community into those institutions that use CAR-T, I think that's where our hematology unit is uniquely positioned. Because of our presence in, uh, in hematology, because of our knowledge of the field, the ability to ensure that physicians refer the right patients to the institutions that will use a CAR-T approach, I think that's a differentiated uh, capability that we have at Bristol Myers Squibb. And moving to, to BB21 to 21, that clearly is the case in multiple myeloma, where we have a deep knowledge of the field. Do we understand uh, um, a patient profiles, who the treaters are, and the ability to accelerate appropriately the referral patients to the institutions that will use BB2121. BB I think that's one of the areas of focus for us. I must say that I am very pleased with the work that I have seen has been conducted by uh, what was the Celgene team uh, that is now part of our organization in terms of, from a medical perspective, uh, in terms of interacting with thought leaders and prescribers and really understanding this marketplace to be ready to execute a successful launch. Now, many of the dynamics that I discussed will play out over time. Uh, the uptake is still going to be slower than, than a more traditional uh, technology, but I think there is a real opportunity to expand that market. Great. Um, it sounds like you're still expecting slower uptake given some of the novelty on the multiple myeloma side for BB2121, but it's fair to assume that we should expect a stronger launch than we've seen with maybe the CD19 CAR-Ts and lymphoma because a lot of these challenges, hurdles have already been worked through in the system. Yeah, I you guys know what to expect going in? I, I think this is one of the areas where, as we've said from the beginning, B number three uh, is probably an advantage versus having launched uh, during the period in which the market really established itself and, and been more sustainable than it. Okay, great. Um, uh, one of the other um, questions we get oftentimes about, you know, Celgene um, is the relevant patent litigation. And so now um, that this is in your hands, maybe walk us through how your strategy will differ, if at all, from Celgene's strategy, and what are the next milestones that we should focus on here in the forward as we think about this yeah. litigation? Uh, so, what, first of all, what I would say is obviously last year there was also one area where, have, where we had some positive developments. Uh, there were uh, two IPRs that were not instituted. Uh, and one of them uh, based on lack of merit. Uh, I think that's important because the starting point is that we believe in the strength of the IP uh, that supports Revlimid. Uh, we also were able to reach an additional settlement with, with a company called Alvogen, uh, and that was aligned with our expectation. Um, you know, as we've said all along, um, we, uh, we have modeled um, as the most likely scenario, the possibility that uh, a number of settlements may happen between now and 2022 uh, and that the erosion of red limit will happen uh, over a period of time beginning in 22 through the end of 25 uh, with full genetic entry in 26. Um, and we're still aligned with that set of assumptions. Uh, now, obviously, um, there are a number of things that have to happen there. We've discussed, uh, you know, our belief that um, the next step may be a, a, a trial. We do not have a date for a trial yet. Uh, there, there is a pre-trial hearing that has been scheduled uh, in, in May. It is possible that the trial starts um, this year, uh, but that's very consistent with the timeline um, that we have communicated from the beginning. Ultimately, we believe uh, the most uh, likely scenario is one where multiple settlements can be achieved. That's clearly uh, something that we will continue to work on. Uh, so I'm not sure I can point to a real uh, difference in, in strategy, but what I can tell you is we're very focused on executing the strategy we communicated since the beginning of uh, last year, and so far the events that have happened are very consistent with our set of assumptions. Okay, great. Um, maybe moving on to Optivo, obviously another um, area of commercial execution and focus for you guys um, as we kick off 2020 here. Um, maybe just remind us of the outlook this year and then that return to growth that you guys have talked about in 2021. What are the key inputs um, in terms of trial readouts? Where do we stand 
you know, where's your confidence level now? Obviously, you've had a couple of readouts in frontline lung, but what are the remaining ones that, that we should be focused on? Sure. So, uh, first of all, I would say the performance with over this year has been uh, strong in, in, in every indication in which the product is approved. It's been very much aligned with our expectation. Overall, the brand, the particular in the U.S., has been impacted by the shrinking of the opportunity in second-line lung cancer, where we've maintained a very competitive market share, but the pool of patients that are available for I.O. in second line has gone down as we were expecting. We've seen sort of a stabilization of that trend towards the end of last year, and we expect that trend to stabilize this year with the final sort of size of the second line market to be about a third of, of what it was originally. Now, speaking to uh, the dynamics you were describing, we do expect uh, the brand to be a growth brand, and I do expect Obdigo to have real opportunities for growth in 2021. Uh, the two positive trials in first-line lung cancer give us increased confidence uh, in that growth because we believe there is an important opportunity there. Uh, I continue to see this year as a year of somewhat uh, transition because of the dynamics related to the size of the, the uh, market opportunity in second-line lung. Uh, but I do continue to see meaningful opportunities for growth beginning in 2021. As I said, they become more real in terms of first-line lung cancer. What are, uh, the, uh, what are the other data readouts that are important? There are a number of important data readouts this year. So, first of all, uh, obviously one of them in the first half of this year is, is 39ER, which is the combination with CABO in first-line renal. That's an important study for us. Um, we expect that study again in the first part of this year. But then more broadly uh, this year, there are a number of other opportunities for data readouts. Some of the, the ones that, are, uh, that I will mention in the metastatic setting, the possibility for data readouts in gastric and esophageal. Uh, and in the adjuvant setting, a number of data readouts which include the potential for uh, adjuvant studies to read out in melanoma, that's the combination of Obdigo and Yervoy, potentially bladder adjuvant, uh, and uh, between the end of this year, the beginning of next year, uh, an esophageal adjuvant study as well. So these are all um, data readouts that are important for Obdigo. I would say beyond simply Obdigo, um, this year, uh, in the second half, we also expect uh, the data readout from the uh, lab 3 of DIVO combination in first line melanoma. And then beginning next year, uh, there is a very broad adjuvant program that begins to read out again between 2020 and 2023, which I think is a, is a meaningful opportunity for the brand as we enter into the segment of early stage. Great. Maybe um, a couple follow-ups there. You mentioned this trend of stability um, on the lung cancer front. Um, maybe about a third of what the original market was. I'm assuming that's in the U.S., but would you expect a similar dynamic in Europe, or is there something different there in terms of that one-third of the original opportunity? How should we think about the European number this year as, as we go through these? I, I would say that I would expect the European uh, dynamics to be very similar. They will happen uh, over different time frames, depending on uh, when first-line therapies were, were first reimbursed, which is obviously later than the U.S. and then the speed of adoption in different markets into the first-line setting. But ultimately, we do expect the same dynamics uh, internationally. We expect them to happen somewhat at different times um, in, in various markets. Okay. Um, and then on the frontline lung, um, 227, uh, we've seen the data last year. Um, you recently got Compendia listing there um, based on that study in first-line lung cancer. Maybe just give us uh, a view on the implications for reimbursement coverage. And then Checkmate 9LA, uh, remind us of the filing plans um, for this uh, as well as Checkmate 227. Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, first, first part of your question on, on uh, Compendia listing, obviously that's a positive event. Uh, I think that it speaks to the value of uh, the data across histologies and, and, and levels of PD-1 expression. Um, and, uh, you know, from, as you know very well, uh, when, when you do have compendia listing, if, if a physician chose uh, to, to prescribe the regimen, I, I think that would, be, that would be reimbursed. We obviously don't, don't promote that regimen until it's approved, and we don't 
uh, expect to have uh, a sort of a meaningful uh, uptake until regulatory approval, but it is a positive event, uh, and it's primarily because of the recognition of the strength and value of the data. Uh, I'm not going to comment on um, um, the, the regulatory uh, front. Obviously, these are two important data sets. We discussed them with regulators right away after the data was presented, and you know, typically what we comment on uh, is um, um, uh, acceptance of files uh, when a PDUFA date is established. You had another part to your question, sorry. Um, well, just as, as you think about the filing, um, well, maybe first the presentation of Checkmate 9LA, have you guys decided on it? It will be at a scientific conference okay. this year. We've not uh, communicated which one. Okay. And then as you think about the filing, how do you, again, how do you balance the time to market versus the breadth of the label? Because I think, again, there's an assumption that 9LA offers you, again, a broader label given, given the data in PDL1 positive and negative. And so how do you balance those two things? Yeah, I think we've, you know, I, I believe it is a, a really good question. And I think it is important to look at those two data sets together. Because uh, with 227, you have a study that is very mature with 30-month median follow-up uh, that really demonstrates the durability of response, uh, the long-term flattening of the curve, and the potential for a long-term impact on survival. That's uh, the key differentiating uh, value of an IO, IO regimen. The 9LA data uh, is, is obviously a, a shorter follow-up because the study enrolled until the beginning of last year. I think what people will be interested in looking at uh, is really the beginning of the curve and whether the crossing of the curve that you see uh, in study two, two, you saw in study 227 because of the rapid progressors can be addressed by using two cycles of chemotherapy. So in order to really understand the value of the therapeutic approach, you can look at the data sets together. With respect to regulatory filings, we've not delayed one of the two filings to wait. Uh, for the other, we thought it was important to proceed uh, with every with every one of them. And maybe as we think forward to the end of this year, do you think we'll walk away with an impression that you guys can grow your lung cancer sales, you know, in that 2021 and beyond from where they end at the end of 2020, based on based on the totality of the data packages here? Yeah, I, listen. I think there is a real. Uh, I think there is an important opportunity in first line lung cancer, which is a large market. I, I recognize uh, that it is a very competitive market. There are established standards of care. Uh, obviously, the opportunity is different than if we had launched three years ago. But what I'm hearing from physicians is that uh, there is an opportunity for a new differentiated regimen uh, to be established in, uh, as one of the options in first-line lung cancer. Remember that over 50% of the physicians that are high readers for lung cancer have experience with Obdigo plus Yevoy, uh, because of the fact that they use it in melanoma and renal, uh, and there they have adopted it very rapidly. So uh, I do see uh, first-line lung cancer. Obviously, we need to get approval uh, and, and get into the launch, but contingent upon a successful completion of the regulatory process, uh, I think there is a, a real opportunity to, to uh, establish a presence in first-line lung cancer, okay. which is a growth opportunity for the brand. Okay, great. And the other trial you mentioned near term is Checkmate 9ER and first line uh, kidney. Um, your current share, I think, is around 30 to 35 percent in the U.S. on Optivo, your boy. Um, do you think a positive outcome from 9ER is important to maintain that market share, or do you think the data that you have, the differentiated IO-IO combo, is enough to kind of keep the status quo as is, or is 9ER important to kind of continue to, you know, stabilize share and expand further? Yeah, I think what we've seen, uh, you know, I think what we've seen is that the combination with a TKI has in initially impacted uh, primarily the, the, the use of TKIs, uh, and we were able to maintain a, a, a very uh, strong presence in the intermediate and, and poor risk uh, segments of the market, which is where we have uh, our, our indication. I think it's fair to say that um, we've also seen some impact on our share, um, and we do maintain a very strong share in both pu pu uh, poor uh, and intermediate risk patients, but I do see 9ER as an important study 
uh, to continue to strengthen our presence in, in, in that field. We have seen some impact on our share from uh, the launch of a TKI combo. Okay. All right. Um, maybe just in the interest of time, moving on to, to Ozana Mod, um, any update on the regulatory interactions and maybe just give us your latest on confidence in a March approval? Obviously, it's another important milestone from the, the Celgene pipeline side. Yeah, so I, I would say things are on track uh, so far for uh, the Perufa date in March, and the teams are, uh, are preparing for launch in the U.S. Uh, again, I think this is another area where uh, we've been very impressed with the quality of the work that had been done in preparation for launch. Um, Ozanimod is uh, uh, a differentiated oral agent with good efficacy and potentially a differentiated safety profile. Obviously, this is a competitive market, uh, and physicians uh, tend to adopt new agents when they have had experience with them. So uh, uh, the MS opportunity is one where we do expect uh, uptake to up happen over time as physicians uh, understand the value of, of Ozanimod over time. Uh, but I feel confident that we're going to be ready for launch in March. Uh, the other important thing about Ozanimod is that this year we'll, we will see the results of the ulcerative colitis phase three program, and I think that's, a, that's an important opportunity for, for Ozanimod, and uh, we look forward to seeing that data. Okay, um, and maybe one follow-up is just how important is having a differentiated label versus Galenia as you think about you know, the outcome of the, the March Padufa. I know that's been a focus in the past from a Celgene side, but as you guys think about the commercial opportunity, how key is that? Well, I think it's important to have a label that really reflects the differentiated safety profile. Uh, of, uh, 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 of the agent. What we've seen uh, uh, is that, um, you know, with the approval of a recent agent, uh, uh, you know, that, that I think there is an opportunity that the, that, the, uh, uh, that the profile is reflected in the label and that we're not going into a class uh, labeling from the perspective of monitoring, but, but rather that maybe uh, you know, there may be a label that really reflects uh, the differentiated profile of the asset. I think that clearly would be important. Okay. Um, and one other in immunology is um, we're going to see the first phase three data for your tick 2 and psoriasis, obviously another important um, asset for you guys on the pipeline side. Could this drug theoretically be bigger than Otesla? Um, and if so, what are the opportunities that, you know, we should be focused on beyond psoriasis for this drug? Yeah, I think that this is uh, one of our most exciting programs, quite frankly, uh, because uh, TIC2 is a very specific uh, uh, selective pathway, and our agent is a very selective agent. Uh, remember, the phase two data was very compelling uh, in terms of providing a degree of efficacy that is similar uh, to biologics uh, with a very acceptable safety profile. If that profile is confirmed in phase three, in psoriasis, we believe our asset can be a really important asset. There is an opportunity for expansion into psoriatic arthritis. There is a phase two study that we'll read this year. Uh, so that is an incremental opportunity. And then obviously the same pathway uh, has made us decide to initiate a series of phase two studies in other indications such as UC and, and Crohn. Uh, and Crohn's, and over time we'll see the results of those trials. I think this is an asset that has the potential to be a pipeline uh, in one asset. It's a really specific molecule that we believe has great progress, but promise, but obviously uh, we need to look at the data to, to understand that. We will have uh, readouts from the first of the two psoriasis study towards the end of this year, and then potentially at the beginning of next year is the second the second trial, and I think these are important data readouts. But we're very excited about the TIC2 agent, actually. Maybe just in the last uh, minute or so, um, we're asking everyone today for thoughts on one potential change that could happen in the, your specific industry, so in this case, biopharma, in the new decade that maybe is underappreciated by the investment community. Lisa, I think that science is moving at a speed which is extraordinary. And so I personally believe that technology uh, and the use of data and analytics has great potential for our industry. Uh, I believe we at BMS have taken a very deliberate approach uh, to the use of data and analytics in, uh, in, uh, on the commercial side at the beginning, but now very heavily in R&D. When you look at 
the leading position we've been able to establish for Eliquis. Uh, we have over 2 million patients of real-world data that we follow longitudinally. It's the largest data set ever in cardiovascular. We've been able to leverage that data extensively from a payer perspective, from an access perspective, in discussions with physicians when uh, that is possible. I believe that the use of data and advanced analytics can truly accelerate uh, the way we do R&D and bring our products to market, demonstrate the value of our products. Uh, I'm very confident that we started making significant investments a few years ago in this area. We have some really concrete examples of how we've already brought that to life uh, at Bristol MySqueeb, and we are accelerating our effort in that area. Great. Do, do you ever think we'll get to a point where we're, we will see kind of virtual clinical trials where you'll be able to replace maybe the control arm with, you know, predictive data? I, I think replacing the control arm is a real possibility. Uh, I also believe that really mining large data sets to understand the real-world performance of assets outside of clinical trials to demonstrate the value is important. And ultimately, I think if we are able uh, to uh, identify signals uh, of activity faster uh, to bring the right assets into late-stage development, that's extraordinarily valuable, uh, and we're working in every one of those areas. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. Today. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.